Hey everybody, final thoughts time for London Dread, which is very, very cool. I mean, Jen and I actually enjoy this quite a bit. This is totally a keeper for us. Uh, we played through three of the four missions, and, um, you know, the game is just a blast. We really uh, have a good time. It's incredibly rich and atmospheric in terms of its theme, in large part due to this wonderfully produced app. Uh, you know, the voice acting in this is really, really great. It makes the thing come alive. It's kind of a shame. I wish they actually read all the intermediate story bits um, just because he's so good I mean because we just can't live up to the quality of voice acting that's on this thing but it's also good to read stuff to each other as well and you know and it's, it's just a blast the the two halves work really well in succession and you know in fact I'm reminded of a game that we played a few years ago that's very very popular very well loved another cooperative real-time strategy planning game Space Alert and we wanted to love Space Alert so much because the, the core gameplay of you know, having to program your robots to move around on this alien or on, on this spaceship that was under attack from all directions. And then after all the planning was done, okay, well now let's stop the timer and see if we figured everything out. The problem with that game was it did not have two player rules that allowed players to only control one character. I so appreciate the fact that London Dread went the extra mile and did the extra work to make this game scale appropriately because the allies are an awesome little addition. And we have played this both as a two and a four player game. And while there's no doubt that playing it a four player game is I, I, it is definitely better because, you know, you have more people around the table to collude and try to, you know, schedule and time. So it also is much more challenging. The game itself doesn't get any harder. It's just more challenging to, her, to you know, to herd kittens, to get four people all on the same page with a timer slowly counting down. And it, it is kind of a shame that, um, you know, Jen and I, will only, as a two-player game, we will, we, we miss some of that, but still... Uh, as you get into the tougher missions and you play at the tougher difficulty levels, like starting with no items or starting with no investigation deck um, or starting with no virtue token, it can get very, very challenging and, um, and still very compelling. Um, you know, as a two-player game, pretty much, well, we've always found that you always try to find the first plot over in the West because we start in the West and you don't have to do extra travel. Then you split up, then you meet up together at the end, but you do have to time when you're hitting certain stuff and you have to figure out who picks up which um, allies and whatnot. So it's still a very fun and compelling uh, experience. And again, why didn't Space Alert do something similar? Um, you know, rather than just saying, ah, just play as a four-player game with only two players. Now, to be fair, London Dread does list a variant that lets you play just that way. If you don't want the allies, you can play the two-player game as a four-player with each player controlling one character, if that's your preference. But Jen and I would never play that way because we think it works great with the two-player rules as is. Although, like I said, it's even more fun with more players. We played it once as a four-player game, and that was a total blast, even if it was almost just pure random chaos. Um, but still, a great, great time. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, some folks who are fans of my show might say, hey, how could you like this game? There is so much dice rolling. And it's true. This is normally something Jen and I don't particularly care for. But I do like the way it's introduced here because um, rolling is, uh, you know, it's, it's not really... Only at the very, very end of the game is rolling required. Um, or... Well, I mean, you, you, basically you have to roll for every one of these plots you get to. And you know, the more successes you get, the, the better rewards you get. Now, um, the, it's less about the roll, though, because with only a 30% chance, really, as you are spending your resources, what resources you have to get more of these dice to roll, you can basically just figure out, okay, how many dice do I have? Divide that by three, round down, that's how many successes I'm going to get. So the rolling adds a little bit of uncertainty, but just a tiny bit, because you can assume most of the time that odds are going to work out the way they're supposed to. So it's just an extra little dash of flavor. It's not the whole crux of the game. And so I think there's just enough of the dice rolling to make it interesting. Uh, another thing, uh, probably much more interesting, is the notion that, again, every time you face one of those story challenges and every step of the way during the final challenges, you have to draw randomly from your trauma deck and there's a one in six chance that you will get something bad happening. Um, and now that actually adds quite a bit more randomness and uncertainty, but I do think that's absolutely crucial because 
if it weren't for this, you could plan things out perfectly um, because you have pretty much all but almost pure perfect knowledge. You don't have of your, investi of your investigation deck, but if you're paying attention, you have a pretty good idea of what's in there too because you put most of the stuff in there. So I do think it's actually kind of essential. And the reality is, when you do occasionally draw, get that bad card that blows up in your face, that flawed ritual, or let's see, where is Jen's? We never actually drew hers once in the whole game. Um, oh, the, the, the memories of her lost sister that just makes her break down and suddenly she can't face. Well, that doesn't prevent you from being able to solve the problem. It just means you now have to spend more resources than you were originally planning to, which means you might have to go to the investigation deck a bit more. Um, you know, it, it, it works. It's really, really sharp. And um, you know, the, the random elements of this game are just a little bit of a, of a juice, just a little bit of an extra you know, jab to, to, to spice the game up. And that's the perfect use of randomness, of dice rolling, of blind card draws in a game. Um, you know, Pandemic has random card draws. The important thing is most of the time you're drawing the cards, you have a rough idea of what's potentially going to come out. And every once in a while, it completely surprises you. The same thing is true here. I, it's, it works works really nicely. Actually, interestingly, um, setting this game up to play is really nice and quick. If you've ever set up and played Pandemic where you have to break up the deck into a bunch of different things and then build the deck separately, setting this game up is super fast, super smooth, just like setting up Pandemic. Um, so on the whole, we really, really enjoy it. Now, there are a couple things. Like I mentioned earlier, I think, uh, in the final, it is a real shame, man. I really wish they would have put on our plot cards just some kind of reminder of, hey, draw your... Because... You get so deep into figuring everything out, it's so easy to forget to draw from your deck. It would have been a, it's a real oversight that they didn't put some kind of reminder. Draw from your deck and add to it. Because um, the number of times Jen and I have forgotten to do that. And, you know, again, four times out of six, it probably, you know, two times out of three, it's not even going to matter. It's just every once in a while, uh, you can get something that helps you or that hurts you. And that is kind of important. It is a por core portion of the game. There is one other thing I do have to complain about, and actually this one is kind of a real bother, uh, and it bothers both me and Jen. It is um, Jacqueline Degas, the Starlet. This is her representation in game. And considering how well thought out and well designed everything else about this game is, when we first opened the box and opened it and found, hey, honey pie, there is a blonde girl you can be, because Jen always prefers to play the blondes because she's a blonde in real life. And she do I have to be a streetwalker? Really? Do I have to be a prostitute? And we're like, no, 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 she's not a prostitute. If you read the text, she's actually a rich socialite. I mean, she was a, you know, she was a can-can girl in France, but she met and married a rich guy, and then he died under mysterious circumstances, and now her sister's disappeared, and there's all this really rich backstory. But all that is offset by the fact that she goes around practically naked through the streets of London having her... And we have no idea why this is here. Because every place else in the game, wherever she's referenced in art, she looks like this. She actually dresses sensibly in a cool, um, you know, purple coat and dress. Why doesn't she look like that here? Because Jen has to spend the... Because this is her preferred character. Because, again, she's a blonde girl. She likes playing blonde girls in games. Um, she has to spend her whole time just embarrassed. Even though there's nobody here, it, you know, it's, it's embarrassing that this is here. Actually, what Jen ends up doing is she just draws an extra item card and she puts it like this. So she's at least, you know, somewhat reasonable. She can at least pretend that underneath she's literally not walking around in her underwear. I don't, I don't get what the publisher was thinking. Why? You know, because this is borderline a, a family game. It's not really because, you know, they're not kidding about the Victorian horror. As you go deeper and deeper into the game, some of the imagery, not the actual art. The art is always, you know, PG. It's always clean. It's always family appropriate. But the descriptions of the stuff you encounter, particularly read by this very talented voice actor, start to get very grim and very dark. Very kind of R-rated horror type stuff. Um, when you start hearing about, you know, blood and entrails dripping from the wall and the sweet suckling scent of... It's like, ah! That's gross. Um, so it is, kind of, it is something to bear in mind. I mean, you might look at this and say, hey, this would be a great game to play with, with our kids. The game gets pretty, pretty hardcore. Um, again, not visually, but just in terms of, you know, what your imagination conjures up as you're imagining these things that you are stumbling across in this tale of Victorian horror. So that's just something I want. It doesn't bother me and Jen. We're fine with it. But, you know, some people, you might want to know that, uh, you know, for if they're more sensitive uh, amongst you. And then, of course, there's also the fact that one player might have to play what looks like a prostitute um, for no good reason. If you want to be a, a female character, though, well, hey, you have another choice. You could be a nun. So those are your choices. 
Prostitute or none. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I can only hope that somewhere down the road, when they reprint this, because they should. This is a great game. Hopefully, it, it finds more of an audience. I would love to see more stuff, more um, content for this as well. Although. The game is very replayable as is. The third or the fourth mission, um, those ones, I mean, after you finish the story, you'll happily continue to play those over and over again because it's less about the story and more about the puzzle of all the stuff, you know, and, and, and trying to work out how to get to the right places at the right time. But still, I would love to see new stories. I'm, I'm not going to say I wouldn't, so I, I hope this game gets more support. And I hope when they reprint it, they rethink this, they put a nice little visual reminder, hey, don't forget to draw your trauma deck, and they fix the rule book. What is up with that? That is such a huge oversight in the rule book that they don't tell you 50% of the stuff you need to know when you're going into the final challenge because there's just like a whole paragraph of text that disappeared somehow. Still, on the whole, great, great game, Jen. I very much enjoyed it. Like I said, it's a keeper. Um, and that's it, folks. That is London Dread. And thanks for watching. Now, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, as always, please let me know. Um, if you would like to complain about how I'm a social justice warrior and I need to suck it up and stop being so politically correct, you know what? I got you. I hear you. That's fine. You don't need to drown my um, feeds with reminders of this. Just live and let live, guys. Just agree to disagree. I'm expressing my opinion. Um, I know what your opinion is, that I'm a, I'm a snowflake and all that. We don't need that. Um, please, as a favor to me, please... I'd really appreciate it if I not get deluged with that yet again. But anyway, that aside, any other questions, comments, concerns, other than social justice warrior um, accusations, I um, let me know. Otherwise, have a very, very nice day, everybody. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.